County Executive and the uh, Supervisor of Carmel and a good friend of my father uh, came to me and, and Frank was the spearhead for the Carmel Mahopak Revitalization Committee as well as a lot of other people that are in attendance tonight and they redid all the sidewalks in town from Mahopak up to Carmel. The, the street lights, the clocks, a lot of other improvements which I'll read here in a second Frank and they um, got grants and, and they had a lot of good concerned uh, citizens. I believe the, uh, the Christmas the Christmas lights are part of that, and um, the, the the parade we have every year now, and uh, they did a lot of a lot of good works with it, and um, now hopefully eventually we're going to continue that up 52 through Kent to the uh, county line. Uh, there was some money left over, and uh, Frank had come to me, and um, he asked uh, if I had any ideas of what to do with it. So. Um, Kathy Walker, are you here tonight, Kathy? Kathy is uh, head of the cemetery committee for the county of our historic uh, uh, cemeteries where all our uh, patriots are buried. So I went to the county executive, Mary Ellen O'Dell, and spoke about it, and we uh, thought that uh, perhaps we could use the money to fund signs to identify our graveyards, because a lot of people, a lot of the historical societies, the, town, the county historian's office, they get inquiries from around the country for people looking for their ancestors. And a lot of these graveyards, you have to cross property lines, there's right-of-ways, you have to cross people's lawns, uh, and they're, they're really hard to find, so we wanted to identify them. So I went, uh, Frank invited uh, Mary Ellen and I to one of the meetings at the Mahopak Library, and uh, we met with, uh, Mr. Ryder was there, Bobby and Sandy Stroh, and uh, who else did I see? A lot of people from around the area, Mr. Latriciano, I see you there, and uh, but uh, uh, Charlie Melser, so anyway, uh, they were gracious enough to uh, transfer the money to the county, to the highway department, to make these signs. And there are 72 graveyards wow. throughout the county, historic graveyards, in our six towns. And now it's time for the legislators to hold up the signs. Oh. <laughs> These are just samples. Stand up. And these are just samples. Stand up. And these are just samples. Stand up. And they're going to be done. Fred, uh, is Fred here? So, I feel like Vanna White. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Fred Penner, our highway commissioner, is going to be bringing these to the historian's office, and I believe Kathy, through the, uh, uh, the prisoner program, the work release program, and through the different town highway departments, they're going to put them up in the graveyards. 
and um, you know, which is it's pretty pretty good, cool stuff. So anyway, uh, I want to recognize tonight the members of the Carmel Mahopak Revi the Revitalization Committee, and we have certificates here for them. And I'm going to just Frank, would you mind coming up? And Wayne, come on up too. And Charlie, any. Bobby, Bobby. No, no, this is great. Bobby Stone. Bobby and I went to high school together, and I did a lot of. I used to work for Charlie a long time ago. Um, but anyway, we have these certificates. Sure, sure. Oh yeah, Frank. Uh, and there are. Frank had given me the list. There are uh, 35 members of the committee. So what we did is we. Uh, uh, the, the legislative office and the, and the executive's office, they printed up these certificates to give to everyone, a member on the committee, and they're numbered in the back. And a copy of this proclamation has gone into the time capsule along with the master list of the, of the members of the committee. And, and I'll read this uh, about all your accomplishment, accomplishments. Uh, and what we're asking every member of the committee Give your copy to one of your kids, your grandkids, or whatever. And in 2062, we want somebody from your family to come here and claim when they open the time capsule. If not myself, I mean, yeah, what are you rolling, rolling it out for? You know, what's going on here? <laughs> Great grandkids, huh? <laughs> but I just want to thank everyone on the committee, uh, the county executive, Mary Ellen, for supporting this, uh, Kathy with the historian's office. So I'll read this. Uh, okay. Um, Whereas the Carmel Mahopak Revitalization Restoration Incorporated is a non-for-profit organization that has created a successful private-public partnership resulting in obtaining funding, planning, and completion of projects that has improved two core business areas in Putnam County. In 1986, the former councilman and supervisor, Frank Del Campo, with the goal of mind of revitalizing and restoring the two commercial core areas of the hamlets of Mahopak and Carmel in the town of Carmel, founded the not-for-profit Carmel Mahopak Revitalization and Restoration Incorporated. Since the creation of the CMRR, okay, so maybe go fast, in 1986, the organization has been responsible for several important projects within the town of Carmel. In 1987, the organization acquired funding through a grant from the National Arts Council and funding assistance for the town and county to hire a planning and architectural firm who developed a master plan for the two downtown core business areas in the hamlets of Carmel and Mahopak. This 20-year plan became the blueprint for many of the improvements for the two downtown business areas. The CMRR worked closely with the town of Carmel and the highway department to obtain suburban trust funding of $2.2 million dollars from, the Putnam from Putnam County for road and drainage improvements, which included road and drainage improvements for Route 6N, a main access route to the downtown business areas. The CMRR organization is proudly responsible for more grant funds and completed projects that have enriched the quality of life in these two towns. The total amount of funding from the CM that the CMRR organization either directly or indirectly brought to the towns of Carmel, the town of Carmel by their efforts to improve the, qual the quality of life throughout the two core business areas is approximately five and a half million dollars, which is really, really wonderful. This is a remarkable and noteworthy achievement by an organization of volunteers as well as a number of government officials from the town of Carmel and Putnam County and business leaders. Therefore, uh, and now therefore, be it resolved that the Putnam County Executive Mary Ellen O'Dell and the Putnam County Legislator do hereby recognize Frank Del Campo and the members of the CMRR past and present for being an excellent example of what can be accomplished by the collaborated efforts of the private and public domain. And I just want to say the rest of the county, we really, the, the other five towns, I want to thank, as a, as a resident of Kent, I want to thank uh, all the residents of Carmel for doing that. That was, I mean, you could have just kept it in the town, but as you see by the signs, it's, it's going to be all over the county. And it, it was, a, you know, with our little county, it's always been a, you know, in my, in my um, attitude, one for all and all for one. And so uh, I want to thank you. And Frank, uh, thank you very much. That's very thoughtful. Just for you to hand out and okay. anyone, you people. Well, I, I should thank you. thank you very much for your thank you, legislator. Thank you very much. I hear, when I hear 2062, I'm thinking of uh, Frank Del Campo Jr. grandson. <laughs> it's not going to be me. But seriously, though, uh, when I was a school administrator in '85, I always worked well with the private and public partnership. And when I became councilman, I said, "That's what I'm going to do." 
is form an organization that brings the town and the private sector and the business community together. And also in 86, you remember, there was a split between the two hamlets. I wanted to bring the town together. And the best way, to get it, getting the Pat Sheehy's, the Riders, Mary Ellen Maxwell, there's so many that couldn't be here. Uh, I combined the Charlie Meltzners, the Tom Latricianos, the Bobby Stroms, who did a lot of free architectural work. <laughs> And we all got together to bring the town together. And I'll tell you, we would not have gotten all those grants for the Chamber Park, for the, the improvements of the uh, storefronts, and even Michelle Powers will tell you, without that master plan, we wouldn't have had the Cornerstone Park. She used that, and that was cited in 87 as the best place for a central park in the Hamlet of Carmel. So they would come together in the evenings, we did Saturdays, Sundays, we lobbied up at the DOT, and we, we, we had legislators, Al Del Chiapa. It wasn't about Republican and Democrat. Al and the late Jimmy McDonough, I have to say even my Republican colleague, you fellas helped me with our, God rest his soul, Arnie Nordstrom. When I was almost ready to do it here, you guys came up on board, many of you are sitting here right now and said, Arnie, that's a good, let's bury the waters. And they're talking about burying wires now. Look at how far advanced we are. If they'd bury some of the wires out in Long Island, we, we wouldn't have these poor people. But get back to the point. I didn't do this without all of these people here and the 30 others that just could make. They came to my home. I came to their homes. We came together. We wrote the grants together. And it's a, it's a credit to them. And I just hope that we become an example of how government working in a collaborative effort with both schools and towns and county, that we can really be problem solvers and not kicking the can down as we see going on constantly throughout the United States. So uh, I don't know if they want to say anything, but I wouldn't be standing here without the Sheehy's, the Riders, the Strom, the Melsers, and a lot of other people. They talked this up, and they lobbied my legislators. And I have to say, every time I got asked to get something done, and God, God bless your father, he, he wasn't a partisan guy. He said, Frank, if it helps the town, I'm poor. And, uh, and he knew I was a little punk ready to take his job, I think. <laughs> but he always came back after the election. He was my best friend throughout his a short life thereafter, and I, I loved him dearly. So thank you again, Richie. Thank you, legislature. Thank you, Mary Ellen. You helped as well, because with the transition, you made sure it got done. You got after Lynch and Pil Pilner, and you brought on your engineer, and I thank him as well for his uh, kind. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, if I, if I could just briefly not take a lot of sure. time, but I, I got to say, if it wasn't for Frank Del Campo, none of this would have happened. Just none of this would have happened. For the Car Carmel side of the project, we would meet over in the bank every week, every Thursday morning, 8 o'clock. And Frank Del Campo supervises the town of Carmel. He doesn't have to come to our little lousy meeting. He, you were there constantly, and you kept on top of things. And you know how you make a difference in life? Sometimes you don't know you're really making a difference. I, every time I drive down Glen Ida Avenue here, I think of what you did. What you did, he went to, to, to the DEP and actually got the DEP to give up 8 or 10 feet of land so that now when you drive down Route 52, uh, right in front of the churches, you know, it's not a dangerous situation anymore. And that's, that's the kind of thing you did. You held us together, and it's, you, you deserve all the credit, I guess. Works both ways. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so Frank was fearless. Frank was fearless because he had a great team of community leaders working for him that wouldn't let him down. We said we're going to build a road. The road got built. We said we're going to build a park. The park got built. We got money for facades, the facades got built, the monies got paid back, our local banks supported us. Deacon Bob from St. John's Church said to me a long time ago, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. Frank did that, he held our feet to the fire. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Wonderful program. Our next um, recipient of a proclamation is the 
Garden Club for uh, Brewster Carmel Garden Club. And I'd like to invite Emmy Lutriciano to come up, please. Emmy, do you have other proposals with you tonight? Yes. Would they all like to come up? Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, hello. Hello. Jane Seifer, Mary Barrett, Elaine Kruger, okay. and Donna Relier. Well, we are here tonight to thank this group of ladies and uh, many others for the wonderful job that they do in our community. I mean, if you looked at the baskets this summer hanging on Philonida Avenue. It was breathtaking how beautiful they were. And uh, to realize that people volunteered to go every morning or every other morning to water those baskets to keep them beautiful is just an amazing feat. And that's not the only location uh, in front of the Walter Brewster House uh, on Oak Street on uh, Philonida Avenue here by Civil Ludington, and by the train station in Brewster. What am I forgetting? Law, law offices. Brewster. The library in Brewster and what? The library and the law offices here. And, and the, law and the office. honor roll in Brewster. The okay. honor roll space in Brewster. Mm -hmm. and, the honor and Cornerstone Park. Park. And, and, Park. 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 and it is just going and going. Highway department. But what, what, this is an entirely volunteer group of people and to give up your time to beautify our community is just such a, a wonderful thing. And, and we just appreciate what you've done. And we wanted to recognize you. Mary Ellen O'Dell and the legislature wanted to say thank you for a wonderful job. Sure. This is Mary Barrett, my co-president. Yes. Uh, Elaine Kruger, I'm sure Elaine is very familiar with a lot of you. <laughs> Jane Seifer, who represents the <laughs> civic beautification from Brewster, and Donna Relier, who also works with Jane and Brewster. And I agree with you, Mary, that um, a community is only as good as its volunteers are mm -hmm. and who respect their community <coughs> and make it more beautiful. And I have to thank, as a volunteer organization, a lot of people who do help us if that's possible. Of course, please um, do. About five years ago, we did get a grant, a, a good large grant from <coughs> Paul Camarda to do the hanging baskets. And Ed and uh, Diane from the Carmel Flower Shop have very graciously given us those baskets at cost. So they are a nominal amount. My husband, Al, and Lou Margolis get up at 5.30 in the morning and go out and water the plants. And this summer, you know how hot it was. And they were out there almost every morning. And it showed. rained very little, and it was very, very hot. And Dave Keith also, who offers his truck up to us, we had a large tank made that is able to water them. And because of that, the hanging baskets did look well this year, although they could have been better, but the heat was horrendous. And uh, Sybil Ludington, I thought, looked outstanding, too, with the... Yes. So we appreciate all that you do, and I'm so glad that you appreciate what we do with our dirty fingernails and <laughs> dirty <laughs> knees, yeah. and we do enjoy it. It's so I thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'd like to make motions to enter the proclamations in the minutes of me. Thank you. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, at this time, uh, many uh, recommended and a great request to uh, recognize the people that were elected. This, uh, whatever that was. <laughs> last <Whatever week>. <laughs> Before saying, uh, or after saying. Um, so, Vinny, will you start us off, please? I would love to, and I'm very proud after 18 years, uh, and I will miss this a lot. Uh, but I'm very, very proud after 18 years to have somebody who's very, very capable taking on the seat come January 1st, 2013. She worked very, very hard at the campaign. She had a great victory, and I would like to recognize Barbara Scuchemar.
And I don't believe uh, Ginny Nasserino is here, but Ginny was elected to take the seat for District 4 in Patterson. So congratulations. <laughs> We're going numerically and we're introducing those who are new to us, but I don't think it should pass without recognizing our returning uh, legislator, Roger Gross, who's uh, starting to serve. Now, poor Roger, he ran last year for town board in Southeast, and we appointed him in January, as you know. He ran this year to fill out this term, uh, which only goes till next year. Right. So Roger will be on the ballot again next year, so he's certainly singing for a supper here. He'll be running three years in a row, and uh, hopefully three years in a row. You're not announcing tonight, but uh, hopefully, yeah. Saving the signs. Saving the signs. And uh, certainly, congratulations to Roger. He's been a great addition to our team this year, and uh, we're looking forward to it. If, and if I, could, if I could also echo your congratulations, Roger, and, and you're in really good shoes because we have a county executive that did exactly the same thing. She ran almost every year, so. Makes for good character. What? <laughs> Advice. <laughs> and, uh, of course, uh, Madam Chair, we have in the audience tonight uh, my successor, Joe Castellano. He's representing District 7. Uh, <laughs> We all know Joe. He lives, of course, in the uh, in District 7 in, in the southeast. Uh, he comes from a county background, working in our county to the south in the county uh, clerk's office there. So he's going to bring a wealth of experience uh, to the legislature. And I've got to say, with, with all the races that took place here, all four of them, um, we saw something I think that we haven't seen in a long time in Buckingham County, and that was the civil race. Uh, I think all eight candidates. Uh, raced each other and competed for each other based on the issues uh, for far too long. Uh, going back, I guess, about six years, uh, I felt the poisoning in button politics in the way uh, some of our colleagues, get not on this board, but some of the colleagues in, in the in the uh, in the arena, if you will, have campaigned. And and I'd certainly like to congratulate all those who for them who won this year, but also commend all eight of them for running issue-oriented campaigns and issue uh, campaigns uh, that were focused on the people and not on personalities. So congratulations to them all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, third item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for October 2nd, 2012. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Correspondence from the county auditor. We have no activity. Pre-filed resolution, it looks like it's going to be the audit and administration show. 5A is approval budgetary amendment for the fiber optics line. It's uh, $18,000. Any, you're moving as chair of the any, any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 5B, approval of budgetary amendment for the finance, re okay, yeah, finance vacancy control. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 5C, approval budgetary amendment for highways and facilities road machinery. All in favor? Aye. 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 5D, <coughs> approval budgetary amendment for shares for the LEP LETPP Homeland Security Grant. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 5E is approval of budgetary amendment for the Sheriff's Department for Selective Traffic Enforcement Program Reduction in State Funding. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 5F is approval of budgetary amendment for the Sheriff's Buckle Up New York Grant. It's also a reduction in state funding. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes, sir. Yes, if, if we could also send a letter to the governor's office that, you know, these both of these programs are important, that Putnam County certainly doesn't appreciate the <coughs> reduction. It means that we can do less or we have to tax our residents more. But I think that everybody can agree uh, we're here for public health and safety. <coughs> these are both extremely important when it comes to public health and safety. And I would definitely want to see us follow up with a letter from you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. 5G, approval fund transfer for the sheriff to purchase computers, scanners, and printers. Madam Chair, a point of order. Uh, this is not properly on the agenda tonight. It wasn't pre filed by the right. This is one of the ones we sent back to you. Yep. yep. So we can take oh, it. So we take it. Sorry about that. Thank you. G list table. H is approval fund transfer for the highway to 
purchase some plows. Madam Chair, comment. Uh, in between the two meetings, Commissioner Penn informed me, uh, informed some of us, that these are for plows themselves, not the blades. Uh, apparently, they're very rusty through, and he was able to answer the question that we asked during the committee. So, that's a point of opinion. Very good. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I is approval fund transfer to the Sheriff's Department for overtime. All in favor? Aye. 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 J is a approval fund transfer to the Commission of Finance for the Humane Society October through December payment. All in favor? Aye. 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 K is um, approval budgetary transfer for purchasing gasoline. <coughs> All in favor? One no. Aye. L is approval fund transfer finance planning and fund retirement employee temporary basis. All in favor? Aye. 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 M is approval fund transfer for the Department of Social Services for temporary. All in favor? Aye. 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 N is approval fund transfer for the Department of Social Services for overtime. All in favor? Aye. Aye. O is approval fund transfer. Okay. This one was tabled also. All in favor? Thank you. P was uh, approval fund transfer for the Department of Social Services for temporary. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Q is approval fund transfer for finance, taxes, and assessments on county-owned property. All in favor? Aye. R is approval semi-annual mortgage tax report, April 1st through September 30th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. S is approval local law amendment chapter 173 code of Putnam County entitled item pricing. Madam Chair, on this one, I'd like to make a motion to amend consistent with what we did at the committee with respect to the legislature determining the late fees in paragraph C. Okay. As, as came out of committee, just not here in the form. Okay. I'll second that. I'll second that amendment. Okay. All in favor? Uh, aye. That's no. the amendment and now for the whole. Oh, you okay. want the question as chair? Okay. 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 Um, moved as amended. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No. no. Okay. Six is. Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah, just a comment because uh, I think it's important to put on the record. Uh, the item that we did 5Q, the approval fund transfer to finance taxes and assessments on, on county owned properties. And again, those are, those are things that often get overlooked, but I think it's very important to state that, you know, that we, we make these fund transfers, we cover these costs, and these all go back to the different taxing units. Madam Chair, if I can use 6A. 6A. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is a local law to uh, amend the Putnam County Code to allow the Putnam County Commissioner of Planning, Development, and Public Transportation to waive the residency requirements within a certain geographic area. Essentially, it will allow the uh, position of uh, Planning Commissioner to live within any, any of the contiguous counties of Button County in New York. Um, this has been before a few committees in the past. It uh, hasn't been at a committee uh, exercising the 60 day rule and putting in before us tonight. I ask for a second on this. Discussion? Nice to have a second. I'll second for discussion. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Who would like to go first? Mm. Sam? I, I stand by what I've said so many times, it's, it's almost redundant now. Our highest level <coughs> positions in this county, I strongly and philosophically believe, need to go to those people who are vested in our county, who pay our taxes, who reside here, who vote here, to, to man such important departments as, as highway, as planning, as some others, and not have that vested interest based within this county barriers. I, 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 I just uh, philosophically cannot support that. I've argued with our school districts all the time, the same thing. You know, the best and brightest are there. We have a big county. I cannot believe that we cannot find a commissioner of planning. And I know a couple of people who would be just absolutely stunning in that position. And, and, and yet we want to rewrite the charter to allow 
somebody from the outside to occupy that, that position. And you know, we've heard the talks, pros and cons. I, I am very much stuck on this issue. I will be a definitive no. And uh, you know, I understand the, the counter arguments, but philosophically, I, I don't abide them. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyone else on this side? Carl? You know, my first choice would be to have somebody from the county be here. That would be priority. If everything was on a level playing field, that's what I would go with. However, I want to see the best person work for this county. We want to get the best bang for a dollar. And I've already seen where this was a big advantage for us hiring outside of the county. So I would support that. Okay. Dan? Yeah, just to correct, we're, we're not, this isn't a local law to change the charter of saying it's just to change the code. I know that, uh, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. No, I mean, you, it's not, but you said it was a charter, right? It's not the charter. Right, I stand mean, correct the code, but it, 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 what it does is it allows this to happen. It does, and, and I'll, uh, I'll share with my colleagues why I'm comfortable with it. Upland County, although we have 100,000 people, we are a very small geographic county. Uh, we are not larger than certainly any of the surrounding counties, or perhaps with the uh, exception of Rockland County. You know, when we're looking for professionals to, to staff our county departments, we always prefer to go in-house. And I'll tell you, our county has had a proud history of not only staffing in-house, they want to say in-house, in-county with uh, department heads and on the commissioner level, department head level, and, and below that. Um, but we've also promoted from within. And I, I think it's important that we do that and we have done that. Here, we want somebody who has a certain skill set, has a certain level of education, somebody who has his professional license or at least not has, has professional certifications. We're not talking about just any position. This is planning. I mean, we've all talked about how important planning is. And for us to limit ourselves within the 240 square miles of Putnam County, I think we do a disservice not only to the, the residents of Putnam County, but certainly the, the service to the future residents of Putnam County. Because we're talking about planning here. Um, this isn't something that's unique. We have other counties throughout the state. Some counties have, have waived all residence requirements for every position almost in, in their county government. So I don't think there's any, any problems with doing this. I, I think uh, the, the, now having said that, we will have to, as a legislature, prove the person that the, the, the county executive nominates. So if there's any questions about qualifications, that's when that should properly come up. But to, to say that a qualification has to be residency, I, I just don't see where that is an issue. I mean, if the person were living in Syracuse and had to commute here every day for work, obviously that would be a problem. But if we're talking about somebody in any one of the surrounding counties within New York State, I don't think there'd be a problem for them getting to work into the kind of state that they're not going to be fully vested in this county merely because they don't live here, I think is, is just false. Uh, we're talking about somebody who has to live up to a certain set of professional ethics in their field, somebody who has a training and capability, and quite frankly, I believe the love to do the job that they do. I don't think that they would exert any fewer efforts or lesser efforts merely because they don't live here. Uh, people who are generally in this field aren't doing it just for the paycheck, they're doing it because it's a field that they love. So uh, uh, we only need five votes tonight on this because it's not a charter change. I would encourage my colleagues, I understand Sam's arguments and the other arguments, and I'm not trying to sell, sell them short, but uh, uh, this is something that we need to do, and, and I think it'll help us in the long run. You know, I, I, not if I could because he made a point that I want to just reference very quickly. Dan, I understand the argument. I'm not disagreeing that perhaps there are individuals uh, very much qualified for this position outside the county. I would be, I, I could sleep much easier if we could tie an amendment on this that once selected, they move into the county. I really feel strongly that being in the county you serve makes that individual part of the decisions that he or she is making. You know what makes me crazy? When superintendents of school go home to Dutchess or to Westchester in Putnam County and they hit our taxpayers time after time with unbelievable tax increases because they're not paying it. They're going home to another county where the taxes are half that size or they have a big business base and they're paying much less. That's what bothers me. And I put that on this. Planning is so important. It's the infrastructure of this county. Have somebody who will be affected by these decisions in that position. I would be much happier if we could put an amendment that once given a position, they have 30, 60, 90 days to relocate here. I think that's a fair compromise. 
and I would ask this board to consider that. I agree completely with Legislator Valeria. I think that the person at the very least should be living here. All of these positions that we're referring to are all top management positions. They're all over $100,000, right. and to suggest that possibly people in Putnam don't have the skill set, I think is short, short selling our, our workforce. And as everybody knows, 70% of Putnam travels outside of the county to work. I think it's very important. To me, it seems like we're cherry picking. We're not changing the charter, but we're changing the code because there's already been somebody picked that the administration wants. We had this discussion several months ago, but the, char the code needs to be changed in order to appoint that person. And I remember us having the discussion on how the position was advertised in the penny saver, which is not the best vehicle uh, for positions. I'm absolutely against this. I caved early in the year when we changed the requirements for the commissioner of planning. I think that we should, I feel very strongly that the person should reside in the county. And I too agree with you, Sam, that if the person accepts the position that we should modify this and they should have to live within the county then, within a certain amount of time. Give them a good certain amount of time to relocate, yeah. but they should. Dr. Ambler did it, John Lynch did it. Good people who contributed greatly to this county. I'm not saying preclude them, but have them be part of the very, you know, infrastructure and the, and the very governmental uh, entity that they serve. That'd be a part of it, to vote here, to, to be impacted by the decisions he or she makes. That's really important. We've had a lengthy discussion about it. It seems to be that um, if there was a decision to split the baby in the bathroom or in the middle, you can't give a person 30 days to move in. I said 30, 60, 90, now, whatever you got to take. You're, you got to be fair to that. You've got to be looking far out at least six months to a year. Easy. We can that's six months. Fair. Six months is that's fair. That's only fair. Six months. Right, but going back to your point, months. Sam, just to reiterate about the, the superintendents, then shame on their boards of education. Yeah, I agree. Because their I boards agree. of education are, are chosen by the people where they live. And, and I've and seen many boards thrown out well, for picking bad superintendents. Because the board is the one who sets the plan. I agree. I and agree. they are people elected by the people who live there. You're right. Man. So, I mean, I, I, listen, we fed this out for a long, long time. I had said if all things were equal, by all means, it should be somebody internal. Again, where we are relying on our, on our people who do the hiring, Paul had this conversation. I got to think in my heart of hearts if somebody was an equal with somebody else, they would go internally. But if the discrepancy is that large, then maybe we look to a certain time frame to say, you know what, why not come in? If you want the job that bad enough, you get six months to a year to have to come in. But then that's got to be something moving forward. Once we do this, then that's got to be applicable, applicable to anybody who holds those spots. And it could be in the future if all things are not equal, the same thing is applies. I don't want to see us go back then again and we do this again. I agree. Because we don't like the way that we're going. You're right. I don't know. Madam Chair, I don't know if that's an option. Richie? Yeah, I, uh, I thought we had already put this to bed. But uh, <laughs> I, Paul Aldrich is not here, correct? Yeah. No. Uh, I, probably a month, month and a half ago, I went down to see Paul and I wanted to see a list of the employees and where they live. And 90 something percent of our employees live in the county. Uh, and a lot of the a lot of the very important positions, um, for instance, the law department, the ADAs, they're not required to live in the county, and they all do. And when you go down the list, a lot of the positions that do, that are not required to live here, for very important slots in the county government, they live here and they don't have to be. So the predominant number of our, you know, and we started coming Sam, to a, 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 everyone, a, a, where 50% of our people lived outside of the county, but we're going for quality and we're going for uh, professionalism, <clears throat> and this is a very specialized deal. And we'll let this place uh, go vacant, this position, way too long. So, you know, if we're going to enforce it um, right down to the wire, we have so many people that, like you said. And the other thing, Roger, I hope you're going to say what you said to me the other day about, I, I don't want to. I can't remember what I said. Go ahead. I don't want to put you on the spot. But you had mentioned it to me, and then you know, um, you had said that you had spoken to someone, and they said maybe it's a, it's not advantageous to have your planning uh, commissioner live within the county. And um, I thought about it. I said, you know, you're right. And I just, just this snowstorm, for instance, that the, the uh, hurricane. I had my brother call me up, and he lives in Carmel, and he says, can you call anybody? 
to help me out with my power. They're telling me 10 days without my power. And I had just left the uh, emergency operations center again, and I, Adam was bouncing off the wall like a pinball machine. Mary Ellen was running around, and I said, no, there's nothing I can do. I said, I'm your brother, but this, I don't have any influence here at all to help you. And I, and I think that you, you, that was to the point that maybe we are so small that maybe we want to have somebody that's a little bit removed that could look at it objectively from the background. I, I, I talked to a planner who's uh, he lives in New York, but works in Connecticut, and um, her position was that it gives some um, flexibility, and the person comes in clean, and there's no pressure to the person because they don't know the, the developers, the neighbors are doing what's best for the county. So that's one you know, one aspect which I respect the lady quite a bit. So that that's opened my eyes a little bit. Philosophically, I agree with Sam and Dean. I like the idea. In fact, though, this gives some flexibility by this, this amendment, or this, uh, this change to the code. The housing market is terrible. You have to give someone, I think, at least two years to move. I think down the line that would be something to consider. Right now, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not happening. Bristol schools used to require superintendents to live in the community. We hired a guy from upstate, uh, Dr. Vody, had to move down to Brewster. Today, um, our superintendent lives in Westchester, so that's something that needs to be re, re looked at, um, certainly. So, my position is um, it gives flexibility to the code, so I'm going to um, support it at this point. I, the other piece I would like to say is we've had vacancies for what, five, six months in planning, not to mention all the other vacancies in planning. I want to get the, that candidate in the job you know, tomorrow, get things going. We've really, uh, we're way behind, so I, I will support this. Okay, yeah, I, I think again, there's, there's an urgency to this. A couple of things, though, before I before I talk about why we need to make this appointment as soon as possible, uh, we have two great examples of where where it worked and it worked well. One is a very old uh, case, and it was John Lynch, indeed. He moved and here. and uh, understand, but he was not living here when he moved here to take the job, and he was living in North Carolina and. We could have easily, way back when, with, with little Podunk, Putnam County, you know, 36 years ago, with the cows and the, and the, and the sheep running through the hills, uh, said, what do we need a real planner for? There's got to be somebody here locally. Why do we want somebody from North Carolina? And 34 years later, we saw somebody that everybody was very happy with. And we, we, we actually, uh, you know, talk about John and the, and the job that he did all the time. Sometimes, I think, he, he, he just tried so hard and tried to do everything that we didn't get the department that we really needed to have fettered out and, and completely, uh, you know, uh, man the way that it should. But, but he did the job that he did and he was a good man for 34 years. The other case is when you find somebody that's exceptional, and I don't want to embarrass Fred Pennant if he's still here, but if you have somebody with the resume in the background that brings you not only the years of experience, but the education and the qualifications, uh, along with the, the network of ability, and besides that, I think that an administration that has to work with, with the top bunch of managers has to have the right personality and, and knows what the administration is looking for, what the county executive is looking for is what she needs to have. I have, I have complete faith in it because when you take a look at it right now in Putnam County, I can easily say that we have the best and we have the brightest, whether they live here or not. They, they do a fantastic job and that goes for every new appointment that County Executive Odell has made so far. So I, tr I trust this one as well. And we desperately need to fill this position. Uh, we had Adam, we had the County Executive, we had the Deputy County Executive all running around during Sandy. A planning could have been a, another vital and important place that could have been there to help us get through what was a very difficult time. We also, at every regional council meeting, and I was I had lunch with President Murray at Maris. He's the governor's representative for the regional economic. Where is Putnam County right now? We can't expect a half a dozen people in this administration to cover NIMTIC meetings, governor's meetings, and all of the meetings that, that, that are out there right now. And we are ineffectively, ineffectively being silenced by not having that person there. That department has been on autopilot for too long. The appointment needs to be made, and we need to do it as soon as possible. And thank you for bringing this resolution to the floor today. Okay. Uh, question? Uh, roll call, please. Legislator Albana. Yes. Legislator Barney. Yes. Legislator Jacala. Yes. Legislator Gross. Yes. Legislator LaBeau. No. Legislator Alvaria. No. Legislator Othman. Yes. Legislator Tamar. Yes. Chair Wilmot County. No. 
I mean, to override the video. Okay. Override. Well, let me ask, Clem, can you just <clears throat> give us a, uh, what our vote would mean if we voted yes or if we voted no? If you vote yes for the override, you're going back to the legislature's uh, Original. change to the budget. You vote no, and you're going back to the county executive's original report. Everyone understand that? Yes. Okay, so do we have a, um, anyone move it? I'm for discussion. I move we move. Second. You need a second. A second for discussion. Okay. <clears throat> Anthony? Yeah, just, uh, and, and I know, just clarification on this issue, because prior to this meeting at Water, we voted on sheriff overtime that was not jail overtime, it was specifically named overtime. This subject contingency, if I'm reading it correct, says jail overtime. Right. Now, the question that, and I want to share if he's here, comes all that we've had over and over the last couple of months is the issue of the lack of staffing and overtime in the jail because of so many state cuts and everything else that now we have to house these individuals. Or we didn't, we have mental health issues and, and, and people that are out there who there's no housing for. So my question is, is, is this impacting that moving forward? Because over the last, <laughs> two to three years has been a drastic change in jail over time because of some of what's happened with the cuts. Is that this account, this subcontingency account, solely, or is this more than just jail over time? It's all over time. No, it's the, all jail over time. It's, it's, all, all, it's, all, it's all jail over time. All jail over time. All jail over time. All, yeah. Yeah. And okay. the sheriff wrote a letter we all received today that explains the reason why he he is requesting you know the increase that it remained that we put in when we did the budget and Sam, the reason why he asked is because there's a i know this from discussions in the town that, that i'm in and they're going through a budget situation right now and the discussion has become centered around staffing what's your population now compared to what it was 10 years ago 15 years ago 20 years ago has the population changed that much that there is a need for so much more of this additional? Not the population the rules and regulations. I know, that's what I'm, I'm just giving you a, a scenario. And we know, you always bring up the education analogy, there's been, in some cases, our enrollments have gone down, but the mandates have gone up, therefore costing. Right. So my question before voting on this is over the last three years, have we seen a rise in jail overtime because of these mandates? That's the question that I'm asking. Well, if I can, Madam Chair, in, in the sheriff's letter, I'm going by that because he heads the department. If anybody knows the department, it would be the sheriff. He, he explains that there are three items, three areas that have impacted the jails the most. One, the requirements for um, recourse to individuals with mental illness and medical problems. They have to be taken care of. You can't ignore that. That's state law, uh, according to the sheriff and they must be dealt with. And if that means transports to a hospital, so be it. If it means transports to, to another facility, so be it. You can't defy that. The second thing is the increase in the female population. 
there just are not enough female guards, and they will not put a male guard down with the female guards, and I understand that. There's a great deal of liability with that situation, so they want to use the female guards, and there are not that many. He's trying to recruit more. He hasn't been able to get it, so he has to bang the overtime. Who's ever there has to stay another eight hours because we can't get a replacement. And, and the third thing is transports in general, uh, whether to the courts, whether to uh, depositions, what have you. Those are a big bang for the overtime, again, according to his letter. And his statement is whether the overtime is kept in subcontingency or not, he fears he's going to need it anyway. And then what we're doing is we're looking at a deficit situation where if you don't have that overtime allocated in subcontingency, we control it all. We don't have to release it. Truly, he has to come to us to get it released. But if it's not there and the need is extreme because he answers to a higher authority than the county, it's the state, and he has to abide by what the judges and the courts have said. So if that money isn't there and we need it, now we're pulling funds out that we never allocated. So I say be safe, keep it in subcontingency, let it stay. Yeah, I, I, I have an issue with this because I, I go back, first of all, the, the, the cases that you have in the jail cannot drive up the overtime as, as we have seen this overtime go. Since 2002, just in eight years, we've gone from 700, 7,000, 727 to 2 million, 214. It is the same demographic. It's the same population by way of a census that was just done. We were the safest county then. We're the safest county now. We're a small enough county, and this needs to be managed. All overtime needs to be managed. But we sit here and we wring our hands over the poor people that are losing their houses and we'll fight over $100 in a budget item and we're talking about something that has absolutely crippled by the time we were finished. And somehow we've got to get a handle on this and this has got to be managed. It's, it's a lot road patrol, it's a combination of things. Nobody has explained all of it to us, but the one thing that I will tell you is as long as there are people losing their homes, and we keep on analyzing and scrutinizing the budget, there is no way that we should let this thing pass the way that it is. And I'm very comfortable with going back to what the county executive recommended. Richie? Yes, just for clarification of uh, Anthony's question, this is for total overtime. This is not specific just to the jail. It's not. Are you sure? Because it says jail. It says jail overtime. It's my question. Jail overtime. Yes. 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 put it into jail overtime. Not just jail overtime. No. How do we know that? Is representative? The budget was 10%. The, the budget was uh, 10% across every department. Uh, okay, it was, they all they were all supposed to, to decrease by 10%. And what we did was we we, we uh, put this as an emergency gap that if they had to go over, we, we, we had an extra basically 2.5% and a strategic reserve in case we needed it. But actually, if the county executive uh, office would respond, I'd appreciate it. Just okay, for yes. clarification. Yeah, I'll right. go. Our original budget was chair. I'm sorry. Dean, you're not the chair. Mary? No, you're not either. And I already asked I have the, the deputy sheriff. Sure. No, I do. Dean, he was a picture. Dean, he asked the under sheriff. The under sheriff. Can you explain the. The under sheriff says the jail overtime is the same as the county. Yeah, that's what it says. It's the same as the county. Just jail. Okay, thank you. That's not our understanding. Yeah, that's so right. When we crafted the budget, the money put in there was for the sheriff and the jail. The right. original mm -hmm. amount of the was the sheriff and the jail. If I could ask you, if I could to the commissioner of finance, Bill, the, the number here on, on the uh, on the resolution that we passed. Hey, I'm looking at the uh, going back to the audit committee meeting we had earlier tonight and uh, the overtime report. Trying to match up the numbers because there is an overtime line in the for the jail, but it doesn't look like the same number. But what is that number there? That subcontingency line 10199. I'm, I'm back on the resolution 10199005499. The the is that is that a uh, obviously it's a subcontingency line, but are there, are there any numbers in that string of numbers that signifies where it would be? Because what we're going on, what well, my understanding was is that it was just for jail overtime because that's what it says in the pros above there. It says right. jail overtime. Yeah. So when I 
passed when I voted on the budget, that was my understanding of the search jail overtime. Yep, I know. And I put you on the spot, I apologize, but uh, I didn't know this would be a question. Uh, but, no, it's, you know, all I'm saying is, regardless of what you guys decided in your budget process, the budget that was given to you mm -hmm. from the county executive's office had that subcontingency for both jail and sheriff overtime. So now, if you, you make a decision to say this is just going to be for the jail, that's one thing. What I'm saying is, from the administration standpoint, it was for both. Okay. So I, we were very uh, concise and clear about okay. that. We're trying to change the behavior here. The you, you, you don't change money, you can't change the behavior. The beauty with this, though, is we don't have to know what it is for tonight because under either scenario, it's they still well, have to come back. It'll still come back. It'll still be continuous. Right. Right. So it was, I'll be honest with you, and, and, and maybe it's my misreading, where it says sheriff jail overtime. Mm -hmm. I thought it was for, for the jail because if it was for something else, we would have said sheriff slash road patrol overtime. But just as it's broken down in, in the overtime report. Yeah, but, but there's so many community sheriffs, road patrol. But, but, but no, there's take, so many within the but, sheriff. Well, that's like exactly it. But I mean, if, if you take a look at the overtime report that we get every month that we're used to, we had it in the nomenclature sheriff dash jail or sheriff dash road patrol or sheriff dash and jail. But so if that's the root of the misunderstanding, it's, it's right. probably hot on both of our houses. But it was my understanding that this was, was the overtime just for the jail. And really, the question is moved because the next legislature, if, if it is asked to take it out, right. they would decide where it exactly. goes. Exactly. Exactly. So, but Sam, you brought this I don't up. know if that's It was possible. intended to be for the jail. Yes. I, I think yes. that the under sheriff would like to clarify. Just the sheriff's office budget is broken up in two areas. One is the sheriff's side, the other one is the jail side. The correction side. This is the correction side. This is your understanding. This is the correction. The budget was 68535 and the committee brought up 200000 or so. But this is just a correction. Okay, that was your understanding. Okay, yeah. Carl's going to it, there's no question that there's a need for this. Okay, the question is, what is the best way to accomplish to reach the goal? Is it with overtime, or is it with changing perhaps the, the amount of people that are working? Should we consider more part-time people? When we go into overtime, it's not the most cost-effective way to accomplish this. It affects the pensions in the future. It's something that goes on forever. It's just dollars and cents. You, you can't go to the public and say a, a million six overtime is appropriate. There, there has to be another way. They're doing a great job. The need is there. You see things are changing in prisons every day, and it's getting more cost, more expensive. But there's got to be a better way. Overtime can't be the answer. We see this happen every year. Sometime it has to change. That's the way I feel. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of other things too, and and you know we talked about the reason for the overtime. And if, if the money is there, then you're not going to change the way that we do business. You're going to spend the money that's there. But there's technology that needs to be utilized in the, in the department as well. I know that we have video arraignment. We, we started with the courts, the transports. There's video <laughs> confession. There's a lot of things that can be done to save money. And if the money is there, the money gets spent. If we can somehow say, look, the people of Putnam County are, are suffering right now. We need to do everything that we can to force the issue, to bring video confessions forward, to bring the video arraignment there, to do the work that we need to do to apply technology. It doesn't have to be the old-fashioned way where we're going to have to put the police officers in a car. All right. So what ends up happening is, is what happened earlier tonight. If we, if we continue to do business that way, then the people of Putnam County are not just paying in this year's budget for this, but this is a legacy cause that is going to go way into the future. That when you take a look at when it is published, the overtime, and that there are a number, a, a, a double-digit number of, of officers, correction officers, that are making more money than the sheriff. And somehow, we just need to handle it. it because it's not that they're getting m that much more money now, but they will collect on that pension, and that will be on the back of the taxpayers of Putnam County for the next 30 years. And this, we're just looking at the Sheriff's Department. This has to be with all departments, and I'm really in favor of what Dan said. 
Let's, let's make sure that we have this stuff published so that people can actually see how the county executive, how the legislature, and how the other executives are managing the departments. First, if I, I came from the private sector. Again, I came from construction and facilities management. And everybody plays the game. I had 15 masons working. And the 15 masons that would be working on overtime to finish a slab on the top floor of a garage, they all knew that in the last five years, we wanted these three masons to get, and I'm not saying it's going on here, but I'm saying, you know what? We need to manage it better. Because somehow, if it's not intentional, it's happening by accident, the taxpayers are still paying. And we need to look at that close. And if we don't take this out, it will continue, and will continue to escalate the costs in the future. Say it in front. With all due respect, Vinny, we're talking about saving taxpayers money. The budget we presented as a legislative team came in at 1.76. If we honor all these video, uh, vetoes, we're kicking it up to 2%. That's saving the taxpayers money. Our budget is a fine budget. We work hard, uh, very hard on it to get it down and preserve programs that were butchered. It's not we did that. It's not no, 2%. It's not 2%. It would be 2%. No, it's not. That's what the document said out of the county executive's office. If, you, if, you if we do all these vetoes, you know, uh, we, we go with them, we have I raised would ask, taxes. I would, instead, instead of dancing in the dark, why don't we ask the auditor what the real number is? I think it's something like 1.8 or 1.8 or 1. What is it, Michelle? In, in this case, she has the exact number. In this case, if we sustain the county executive's veto, the tax rate will go down by a slight bit from the 1.76. Well, we do have two other vetoes. One no, I'm saying let's pack it, the three vetoes together. If we don't defeat them, our 1.76 goes away. We it increases. 1.85 is what it is with yeah. Michelle. It would take the entire package. Yeah, it would be 1.85. And we're we, coming in at 1.76. Well, my point is it's not 2%, thing. Sam. It's and, and giving overtime where we don't have to worry about having a deficit to, to fill that overtime because regardless of what you say, you, 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 you know, the, the electronic uh, testimonies and things like that, that comes out of the DA's office. He has to arrange that, not the sheriff. The sheriff simply guards, feeds, and transports. So the, the transport prisoners. is the That's money. That's it. The transport is the money. If there were another plan out there where they said, sheriff, don't transport him, use this system, he would do that, I'm certain. But he's not been told that. And there are laws regulating that, that if a prisoner decides he doesn't want to do it, they don't have to do it. I looked it up myself. So, you know, we're, we're playing nickels and dimes here. We have a great budget, ladies and gentlemen. 1.76. We preserve $650,000 transportation system. We provide backups for overtime that we know we're going to use. Why are we doing this? I ask you all to, to override every one of these vetoes and get our budget back where it was. We have a great budget in that legislative packet. You know, just to simply, I mean, I've been a small businessman for 35 years. I look at overtime to cover things that are unanticipated. If I know something's going to happen and I'm planning in the future for something, I'm not going to cover it with overtime. I'm going to cover it with regular hours. I'm going to make accommodations that make sense. What's the most cost-effective way to meet this need? Can't be overtime. Anyone in the world will tell you that. You have to plan. We know this is going to come up, so there's got to be a better way. That, that's my opinion. But it goes back, I know we keep on talking about this, but it goes back to the issue, and I agree with you. The issue is that the cost benefit analysis has to be done where if you know it's going to come up and you don't have the current manpower, then what manpower do you need? So, I mean, then that's something that needs to be charged in January 1 exactly. of all departments now, not during the budget cycle, but now. If you need additional staffing and you can prove to us that it will be cost effective, who do you need, why, and then the same way you have to hold the person or people to the fire, that's what we have to do. It's now, we want to do this at the 11th hour, right. okay? Steve. So the question is, what's going to change going into next year? That's the issue. I don't know what because there's nothing on the books right now to change it. So whether it's the sheriff, whether it's whatever department, how is it going to change? If the individuals aren't there to man it, I'm being honest, for next year, how is it going to change? We're going to be, the only thing that we do so while we did this, and listen, I understand about holding people accountable, but how is it going to change? 
okay, for next year when the bodies aren't there. And that's the reason I believe this board deliberated to put it into some contingency, because then we can say it's not automatically there. You gotta get our approval to do. So I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying, and I agree with you, but how does that change for next year? Because if the, the individual bodies aren't there, how do you do it? I'm just asking the question. I don't know, how do you do it? That's the, that's the issue. That's the problem. The other thing is that we're going on spikes here with the economy. Part of the problem with the jail is because of the economy. Mm -hmm. And it goes up and down, so it's not a set cost factor. I called for a report for next month for a plan for the Sheriff's Department going forward. And you know what, with all due respect, Vinny, I love the way you speak because you can sell the Brooklyn Bridge. Three years ago, when legislator Fusco was here and went after the overtime with the Sheriff's Department, he got ridiculed and kicked to the curb. Now this is all politics. Now tonight, I don't everybody's talking. That's fine. really not fair. I think, I think and, and, and I don't appreciate your comments again yeah. tonight. I think, I, don't, I think it is fair. I think okay. that um, okay, let's call the there's question. a lot of stuff going on behind we'll call the Call the question. Yeah, call the question. <laughs> Roll call, please. Now, if you vote yes, it's to the cha to change to what our budget was. Right. No puts it back to the county executive's budget. Legislator Albano. No. Legislator Birmingham. No. Legislator Carla. Yes. Legislator Gross. No. Legislator LeBou. Yes. Legislator Alberry. Yes. Legislator Ackman. No. Legislator Tumani. No. Chairwoman no. Calhoun. No. No. Veto sustained. Veto sustained. Madam Chair, I'd like to move item 62C. This is resolved that the county executive's veto of resolution number 231, gain from sales tax on acquired property at the legislative reconsideration is hereby overridden. I'd like to move that I ask for a second. I'll second that. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, and this is just a rehash of what we talked about earlier, or at least my, my, my comments tonight will be a rehash. Uh, originally, as you might know, I was a skeptic of this program. I thought uh, that the way we were selling properties in the county uh, was tried and true for many years, and, and uh, the county executive presented something new a few months ago. Originally, I was reluctant, and uh, now I'm calling it the best idea Birmingham's ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm a bit more bullish. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm a bit more bullish on, on the amount of money I think we can get next year, and, and, and if we're talking dollars and cents, every uh, dollar that we budget here. Uh, to in anticipation of receiving money on uh, property acquired from tax sales would be one less dollar we'll have to put on the real property taxpayers. Uh, I, I, you know, it's a new program, and, and granted, this is just not for that new portion of the program. The county executive in the program said it's only select properties right. that will have this new uh, NLS listing. This is still going to have a, I don't know the great bulk, but a good many of these properties will still go through the traditional sale. And let's not forget, we haven't had a sale in a few years. Exactly. So there's a significant backlog. I know we just put $71,000 uh, in the budget this year. Uh, tonight to pay for pro property tax on the budgets we have. We have a commissioner who is eager to sell as many properties as he can, and I'd advocate, uh, with all due respect, uh, to ask my colleagues to override the county executive veto because I, I think we're going to realize this, and, and I think it would be a great uh, testament to her program. I was in Jess when I was calling it of course, to her program that will hit this, and I think, uh, not that we can mend it tonight, but I think we might even go even higher. So I, I encourage my colleagues to override the veto. Okay. Yeah, uh, you, you know, looking at this, um, originally, after a lot of discussion and study, my own feeling was a million dollars would have been realistic. We, I, I, after talking with many of you, I, I realized that that wasn't going to go anywhere. But <laughs> 600000 certainly is reasonable. And, uh, you know, the properties, two of the prime properties in Putnam Valley are zoned business they're on business property two of them on busy corners and uh you know one contains an acre and a half they may have to destroy the the existing uh building that's there but that's built that's a right by town hall it's a perfect location the other one is in the center of our business district and renovations on that building will be allowed so any sharp uh, business individual certainly would want the opportunity to try to purchase these, and I, I do not believe that they would be going for 50 or 75 grand. I, I gotta tell you, more realistically, and I'm lowballing it, 200, 
250, maybe 300,000. That's just two properties in Putnam Valley. And I know there's one in Southeast that's business and a bunch of others. So I really believe that uh, this will be good. And I've supported it from day one, and I give credit to the county executive because this was your idea. And it's a, it's a damn good idea, it really is. And uh, it, it's gonna make the county some money. I really believe that. Yeah. I guess we've come a long way on this issue from the day where we said that it was going to be hand-chosen real estate people that were going to make the sales for these properties, and I remember those discussions, but you know what? It's it's the way that it goes, and boy, i got to tell you, you know, you should have left that Nelsonville cemetery, cemetery. I thought it was because I was retiring it was here, but you guys are killing me tonight. You're <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, mean, I live in Nelsonville, and I said, Nelson, where is the Nelsonville cemetery? It's probably in my front yard tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, um, Look, you know what, we can, we can all agree to disagree on different things. We're talking about something that is a new program. I think we need to be conservative with it. I didn't realize that uh, the property in Oregon Corners had become the next Times Square down there, and this property was that <laughs> important. <laughs> but but, I, but I, I really do want to say, that, that particular piece of property, I just did a little bit of homework on. And, and though there may not be a way for us to return it to a special fund or a special account, or maybe that's a discussion that another legislature has to have. I think that when we take a look at if in the middle of Putnam Valley, where there's a bank, a school, and a couple of other nice stores, and you know, Marie Zarcone, who owns, God bless her, a lot of that property, um, there's not a lot else there. So if we were to get three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000, okay, we pay on Georgia's Superstation, the taxpayers pay on Georgia's Superstation, $585,000 to repair a retaining wall, to pay the towns, the, village, the, the towns and the school, the taxes that they're due. But what does that have to do with this? So the, what that has to do with this is, it's not a windfall that all of a sudden we're going to get $300,000. Woohoo, let's celebrate. We got $600,000 if we sell a couple of bucks. No, we maybe get... Fifteen, twenty, fifty thousand dollars from the sale of that property. When you do the net, this was on the back of the taxpayers that we did the work that's there, and it should go back into the general fund because it's a loan from the taxpayers that we made. That's how I'm looking at it. And and I am also really concerned for the future that this becomes a one shot. That the economy is bad, that there are properties there. I know that the county executive disagrees with me, that there's always going to be good properties, and we can always do it. But you want to know something? I think we have to be cautious with it. I think we have to test. It's a new program. Chapter 31 is brand new, Dan. Thank you. And, and I think we need to be conservative with it. And, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's time to get bullish on a program that we don't know what it's going to bring us next year. Yeah. On, on that point, if, if I could just on that, it, it, it's, again, the whole program is new. We're still, like I said, the, the great bulk of properties are going to be sold tr through the traditional, you know, uh, auction process, uh, or a, a good number of them, I don't know if it's the majority. Uh, and also, Ben, I understand what you're saying, I know, I know Bill's been talking about this for years, there is a certain amount of sunken money we put into these properties, even just advertising them themselves is a cost. And not. however, but that, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube on that. Right. There's not an offsetting, had there been an offsetting appropriation that you're talking about in the 2013 budget, then I think we'd be comparing apples and apples here. It's just simply a, a revenue line, and whatever we get, it will go back into the general fund. Uh, it, it, it's not going to be appropriated to, uh, to the cost. Maybe it should be in the future, like you said, and, and you know, Bill could help us out with that kind of accounting in the future. But, but again, I, I, I hate to see the taxpayers be, be banged. And again, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm not pretending to be an expert on this at all. But I hate to see any, any dollar we decrease from here will be an additional dollar that the taxpayer is going to have to pick up on their real property taxes. So for me, I, I think it's important that we override this. I really do. Okay. Thank you. Carl and then Richie. Yeah, I, I've always supported this, this resolution. Um, I think it's a good idea. I just, because it's brand new, I'd rather be conservative. I don't have strong feelings either way, so I go either way on it. Right now, I'm going to be conservative. I hope I'm pleasantly surprised and we collect more money than we anticipate. But I would rather play it safe and just see how it takes off out of the hole. Thank you. Yeah, you're, uh, I argued against um, approving this in committee. You're formulating your budget on an abstract number and a, and a, and a, a hopeful sale. Uh, on the national level, you know, Congress is in for a Downey Brook. Um, we don't know if, this, if the uh, state of our county sales tax is going to be carried in Albany. Um, I just don't feel comfortable uh, formulating my budget and voting on our budget on an abstract number that's in the air. I don't think there's going to be a lot of people around that are going to be able to buy the property. So. 
I have, I don't know why we're, um, why don't we just, you know, err to the side of caution, and if we do sell and we make a profit, you know, great, but I don't want to formulate on a, on a, on a, a number that's in the air floating around. Richie, we, that's what the budget is. You formulate it on what you hope and what you project to be on every single item, not just this, sales tax, uh, what Medicaid, Medicare is going to be, what our, our, our prisoner intake or outtake is going to be, all those things. It's, it's, it's not a crystal ball. You have, you, a track, study it. you have a track record with those programs. This is brand new. But, the, but we have a track record also of real estate values and appraisals, and that's how this is going to work. It takes it out of the realm of let's put it up for bid and see what we get, which is a flawed system. This is a solid system. No, I, this I is understand what you're saying. I, I, just, sir, I don't like rolling the dice like that. And, and the other thing, Richie, we just saved a whole bunch of money out of the sheriff's overtime, so <laughs> your concerns don't need to be, okay. you know, we took care of that. Yeah. We, we got that one. We're going to have to save a lot more money a lot of places in the future. Let's save it on all fronts. Yeah. And just to wrap up, from my perspective, I don't want to sound like anybody else, it, if it makes people feel more comfortable, I think the commissioner of finance told us the, the amount was originally pegged at about 10% of the assessed value of the properties that are will be offered net, 10%. Net, 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 ten percent of the net number. So, you know, it's it's, it's the, the, the most important thing to remember is the gain on the sale of property. It, it's not the gross amount. Sam just said, what does that have to do with it? When yep. he was talking about Georgia so it has yeah. everything to do with it. But that's because been paid. That's been paid. It's a revenue source. Over the five eighty five. Remember, it's the gain. It's the net. But that doesn't have anything to that do with That doesn't have anything to do with the revenue. Again, what we're predicting in revenue. What we're predicting from these sales, Bill. You know that. You, yeah. you know that. You're, you're an accountant. I mean, that has nothing to do with it. There are certain no, something. It's, but it's the gain. For this yeah, budget, right. I mean, for 2013, yeah, that has nothing to do with right. it. What right. Because 9 out of 10 of these sales is going to result in a loss. Okay. We'll, we'll call the question. Yeah. Life is well, like a bunch of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Just to to clarify, if you vote yes, it's you going to right. then it will be the six hundred thousand. Right. If you vote no, it goes back to four hundred and twenty-four. Right. Roll call, please. Legislative Alabama. No. Legislative Birmingham. Yes, to override. Legislative to Carl. Yes. Legislative Groves. Yes. Legislative Labo. Yes, to override. Legislative Alberia. Yes. Legislative Alabama. No. Legislative line. No. Jail on Yes to override. Motion carries. Um, I mean, six. Sure, I'm 6B3 for discussion resolved that the county executive is veto of resolution number 238, management adjustments, county clerk, confidential secretary, motor vehicle department, two deputy county clerks at the legis legislative. Reconsideration is hereby overridden. I'll move it for discussion. I plan on supporting the county veto <coughs> uh, on this subject. Um, Second, it. You can call the question. Okay. 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 Folks involved in the initiative here um, were annoyed, and I would even say angry at the, uh, the way this came out. And I regard contingency as more or less a, uh, a stipend out there. So I didn't see it as a, as a big problem. You know, so I support the initiative, the creativity in the Department of Motor Vehicles. We also are led to believe, um, and I certainly support that, that the state's trying to capture revenues from these DMVs all over the place. And they'd like to take over our Putnam uh, County DMV, I'm sure, at some point. And um, the more things we can do to protect that and capture revenue for ourselves, the better. But um, I just want to be prepared for um, an eventuality. I'm wondering if that would happen with the stipend money then go back to the budget and just come away from the folks that were granted it if the program is no longer in existence. I guess I'm trying to say is if we approve it, then the monies are there forever and ever, or can they be withdrawn if, the, if something changed the DMV or regulation came along? If, well, the, 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 to answer that question, we would have to lower the salary because these changes in the executive budget, correct, from our, correct me if I'm wrong, are changes to salaries. They're not stipends. They're actually increases in salaries. So there's nothing to say that we can't decrease salaries. But uh, if the program were to change or if the program were to be deemed not successful, 
Um, you'd have to make that argument and get by the legislature for the legislators to agree to lower someone's salary. And uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember the last time that happened. <laughs> Maybe? Yeah. I, I want to start out just by saying, you know, uh, first time around, uh, we got very involved in, in, in the debate over let's see what's going on quarterly, let's see how the program works, it's a new program. I, I need to apologize to not only uh, the, the county clerk, but to the, the people who are out there with this program. Uh, there is no reason to think that this program is not going to be a success and we don't have to uh, put it into a sub-contingency. We got kind of really bogged down in a long discussion on just getting a report. Our report is always just a phone call away. With, with a county clerk that's always willing and able to give us whatever information we need. I think that uh, if we do have that problem uh, that you spoke about, Roger, <laughs> it's a much bigger problem. It's because of the state's heavy hand probably trying to take over our facilities. But as long as we have the county clerk that's running that facility, our, our county clerk's office, and running this program, this is only headed to be a great success. It has to be. Yeah, I renewed my driver's license the other day. Uh, it cost me eighty dollars and fifty cents for eight years. Uh, I think I just calculated approximately eleven dollars went to Putnam County. Uh, the more people know uh, with any kind of advertising on the on the screen, the monitor that we can let them know this. They don't do it online at home. Let's do it. Let's get the money into the county. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally support that position. When you when you sit there and think of the amount of money that this could bring in, it's great to see that there's people out there thinking of creative ways to bring more money in. We're talking about seven thousand dollars, it's not even a question. Even if it were to go into the future, if we generate that much more money every year, it's a no-brainer. Imagine if every department could do something like this. I'm I'm kinda of lost because we just had this huge debate basically on the same exact thing. And yet you know, when the vote came up and everybody has the right to their vote, we talked about the other plan being great, just like this plan is great, and to put the money in. Well, it's the same analogy. To me, what's the difference? Just think about it. We just took a vote, and it's the same exact analogy. We felt the program was great, that the, the county executive had put in, and we think it's going to bear fruit, and that's why we took the vote the way it was. And so there's there no difference. We're right? the same exact argument. But yet, when we voted, it wasn't that same argument, so I'm kind of lost. So if we're going to be consistent, then we need to be consistent. That's fine, I get it. But then, you know, let's make sure that we are that way and that we move that way because if we feel this is a great program like the other one was, and yes, we feel it's going to bear fruits, then we vote the way we have to. But, you know, it's interesting because we look at one thing one way and something differently. And I think we need to be a little bit more, as we can be, consistent in the way that we look at things, to be equitable across. I mean, to say focus, the resolution that's in front of us is to um, allocate almost $8,000 in salary increases for a program that hasn't even begun. We're compensating people for work that hasn't taken place yet. I think we're all in favor of the program. We had this discussion when we went through the budget. I think the question is whether or not uh, the $8,000 should be up front or we put in contingency. This is in contingency. This is what this resolution is. And you know, I'm going to repeat the comments that I made during the budget. Um, when the county executive made the presentation, she said no increases in salary, no layoffs. Well, there is quite a few salary increases if you've been lucky enough to be chosen. And I think that's a real problem because we're cherry picking people to get increases and we're leaving a lot of people behind. And uh, again, this is just a discussion. We're voting on whether or not this $8,000 should come out of contingency and go straight into the budget line. Right. Okay. Yeah, just, you know, the thing is, we've looked at this twice already. I don't want to have to look at it again. In my heart, I feel 100% this is going to be well worth it. Let's just put it away. Somebody came to us with an idea that's going to make us money. Again, if anybody in other positions come to us with an idea like this, we should look at it. Um, we play around putting contingency, not putting contingency. I think it's, it's just put it away and that lets me be done with it. It's going to make us money. It was a good idea and it's good to see people go above and beyond. That's what we want. Richard? Yeah, quickly, there has been a lot of work done on this already. Uh, there have been multiple car dealerships that have been contacted and, and, and we're trying to recruit them uh, in Dutchess, Manchester, and Connecticut. Uh, the groundwork for the IT, for the monitors, um, to, to what they would display, the meetings with the different department heads, what they would like to see, 
in the in the uh, DMV as people wait online and and just getting it out there to the public. It's been there's been a lot a lot of work done on this already. It's not going to just commence when the you know when we vote yes. It, it, there's a lot of work that's been done already for uh, before. So and revenue coming in. Uh, groundwork unit. I don't make a sense of the job, so I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I just want to say. There's no crosstalk, please. I, I, the statement that I need to make is, I, you know, I, I really don't believe that anybody's being cherry-picked. We had a, an exceptional department head that came here with an idea, and I think that the epidemic that's in government today is that it's one size fits all, and, you, you know, we're not going to do anything different than what we're currently doing regardless. I think government has to change and we need to probably lead it in, in the way that we think about how our departments go about it. As, as Carl said, I don't know if you said it tonight or you said it on the phone, Legislator Albano said, you know, I would do this all day long. If we could be guaranteed revenues in every single department and, and you give a, a small stipend to those people that come up with it, why not? It, it, it's not? It's not something that we should say, this is government so we can't do that. But we need to figure out ways that we can bring more revenue in and reduce the property tax. And it's a matter of getting creative. No, government hasn't, hasn't really done that freely before. But maybe it's time that we start to think about it. It's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, again, it's one of those nights that this is what the legislative process is all about. Um, Remember, if we do this, which I don't think anybody's objection to do it, but it's just a matter of how it gets done. We're then setting a precedence for all other departments. You know, the issue that I have is it, it's here's, and I, I'm, all, I'm all for it, but why can't we wait till it happens? It's like merit pay. You do it, the merit, it's based on it. Because here's the reality, nothing against uh, uh, the clerk and the, the people. We just talked about compounding over time. Well, once they get these adjustments, again, gentlemen, ladies, it's the same. We're arguing where we have to be consistent. Once they get the salary increase, and you know what? If they get it and they deserve it, fine. You can't have one argument one way and then not have the argument the other way, and I'm all for it. What's the big deal whether they get the money in their paycheck in January or they get it in June when they hit it, they get it. And then we're setting a fair precedent for the rest of the departments to say it's a great idea when you show it to us, you get the money. Because once we give it to them, like we said before, the argument is you get it moving forward to the rest of your retirement. It's the same that we can't have it both ways. So all I say to you is I'm for the program. We discussed it, discussed it. We think it's all great. We think it's going to work, so whether it works, whether it's a month or two, you get the money or not, and then we're being consistent when we move forward with other departments. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. All, right. all right, so a vote of yes would be to override, and that would leave the money in, in, in sub-contingency, correct? Mm -hmm. And no would be to, to take it out and, and put it on the salaries right now. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's it. Uh, roll call, please. Legislative Army. No. Legislative Army. No. Legislative College. Yes. Legislative Rose. No. Legislative Alberia. No. Legislative Alberia. No. Legislative Alberia. No. Chair Yes. Okay. Thank you. Motion to adjourn, Madam Chair. Second. 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 Second.